we were about the same age, and I'd grown up knowing every step he took. Looking at him now, it felt like I was looking at my whole life. You think you know Gotham? You think you know why you do what you do? You think you even know who you are? Today, on the Comic Book Report, Gotham City, Year One. Stick around and check it out. Greetings from Gotham everyone, my name is Dominic and today you're tuning in to the Comic Book Report where we review comic books and graphic novels so you can get an idea of what to read. And today I'm going back to Gotham City with this epic from Tom King and Phil Hester. Of course I'm talking about Gotham City Year One. This was a title that snuck up on me but when I heard it was released in hardcover I had to pick up a copy. Before we jump into today's review though, I just want to shout out our channel sponsor, OrganicPriceBooks.com. If you're looking to pick up your own comic book collected editions, I highly encourage you to check out their website. You can find a link for it in the description for this video. And if you find something you like, you can even use my discount code at checkout, The Comic Book Report, to save $2 off of your order. Please note if you use my affiliate code or link to make a purchase, I will earn a small commission, but it's a fantastic way to support this channel. Thank you for considering. Now let's get started with today's comic book review. First, some quick facts about today's collection. The issues in this volume were written by Tom King and illustrated by Phil Hester. The comics in this volume were published by DC Comics beginning in 2022. The volume itself collects Gotham City Year One, issues 1 through 6. And finally, this is a standard edition hardcover from DC Comics with matte printed paper stock, a glued binding, and a total of 208 pages. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and issue a general spoiler warning. I will be flipping through the contents of today's collection and commenting on plot points throughout. You've been advised. Okay, and here's our first look at that standard edition hardcover from DC. And I have to say, right from the jump, this was a really anticipated title for me when I finally heard about it. I was a bit late to the game. It kind of reminded me of when Batman the Night came out from Chip Zdarsky. I love Chip Zdarsky in the same way I love Tom King, and yet I was late on both of these titles. I had no idea they were coming out until they were basically here. And once I found out, I knew I wanted to save up money to get my own copy. I was really happy with Batman the Knight, and spoiler alert, I'm really happy with Gotham City Year One. I will say this is quite a bit different than I expected, but it was still a fantastic noir that I really cherished. The dust jacket design is absolutely stunning on this collection. It gives you a good sampling of what that artwork from Hester looks like throughout the book, and I really love the color palettes they chose for the uh, dust jacket. It's really moody and atmospheric, like this book. Really well done, DC. I think you've absolutely sold what this product is. Yeah, I just really love this art. Such a unique piece here. And now we're going to go ahead and take one more look at this dust jacket. I'm also going to show the interior flaps of the dust jacket. Spread it all out too, so you can just get a better picture of what the exteriors of this book look like. And after we do one final look at that, I will transition to showing you what the under the dust jacket artwork looks like, printed on the hardback book itself. This is just such a stylish book, and from the cover alone, the art printed on the hardback book, everything just screams style, mood, intensity, and I just really just can't tell you how well suited the exteriors of this book are to really convey what we get inside the book itself. I really love seeing that. I love when you look at the book and you judge it by the cover. It really does give you a feel for what's to come, and I think it really does pay off well in the case of Gotham City Year One. Looking at the Under the Dust Jacket kind of artwork stamped on the book itself, we have two of the variant covers uh, in this collection that are the front and back cover respectively on the hardback itself. We have a new spine design and overall, again, just really, really beautiful. I'll do a spread so you can see as well just what this whole book looks like. Overall, I'm just walking away really feeling like DC put a lot of care and attention into this print. And after our last look at the exteriors here, I will go ahead and show a quick look at the binding for this book. As I mentioned, it is a glued binding, but overall I didn't have too many issues with it. It is a six-issue miniseries, uh, standalone kind of story here, and I think overall it was well bound. You can see for yourself as I flip through the book though and make your own determination, but I had no real problems with the binding. 
Okay, and now we can go ahead and jump into the book proper. And this book, really, just from the very beginning, you absolutely get a taste for what's to come. And I think that right away, within the first couple pages of this book, you can really tell whether or not this is for you. As a fan of more gritty crime noir, detective fiction, old school kind of hard-boiled protagonists, this was right up my alley. I think that this is 100% a noir. It's stylish. It's interesting. It plays with a lot of the tropes of that genre, and it's all executed exceptionally well by Tom King. I do think we have in Slam Bradley that kind of hard-nosed, hard-boiled kind of detective PI character that... All of these kind of gritty detective noirs need. I just think it was really executed well. The backdrop of the city is a 1960s era Gotham City, and I think that that's the perfect place to position a story like this. For those that have no background in this story, again, this is a six issue miniseries that's kind of set by itself. I think you can absolutely read this as a standalone work. Even if you're not familiar with the greater Batman mythos, you can enjoy this for just a kind of detective crime story. But of course, if you're long Longtime Batman, Bat Family fan, you will notice a lot of fun Easter eggs throughout this book, particularly at the end. Uh, but overall, it's really just a good crime story. I do wonder how this sold compared to the other kind of front running Batman books. I could see this going under the radar of a lot of people, like it did me up until I got a copy. Uh, but there really is something special about this book that I really enjoyed. The title, borrowing, of course, from the incredible Batman Year One by Frank Miller, this is really kind of another year one-esque story. It's sort of an origin. I know I did a review for Robin Year One, Batgirl Year One some time ago on the channel. They've done a lot of Year Ones over at uh, DC Comics under Superman Year One not too long ago. And anyway, when I heard Gotham City Year One, it piqued my interest right away. Being such a Batman fan like I am, another Year One moniker, I was just like, what could this possibly be about? And again, this is set in around the 1960s, and it really takes place about two generations before Bruce Wayne. The, some of the main characters here are Bruce Wayne's grandparents, and of course this main character, Slam Bradley, who is again this once cop who's now a private investigator, and he kind of gets embroiled in this big kidnapping plot, and we have him kind of trying to find a lost girl, the lost princess of the Wayne dynasty. Uh, this is at a time where the Wayne family is really just kind of like the royals over in England. They're just kind of the head family in the city. They're sort of the, uh, the almost like the figureheads of the whole city. They're the captains of industry, the kind of shining light of Gotham City, and they have this young girl who has been kidnapped. It's not public knowledge, and right from the beginning, we have Slam Bradley basically being accused of being the kidnapper, or being affiliated with the kidnapper, and right away, we're just jumping right into the action. He's in over his head almost immediately. No one really believes him, and he's not only trying to kind of clear his name, more than anything, he's trying to find this lost girl. Interestingly enough, Gotham City is painted as kind of a pristine city. This is before the corruption just inherent in Gotham City that we've all come to know and kind of be just mystified by throughout all of the Batman mythos. This is at a time where actually crime in Gotham is less than in a city like Metropolis. It's considered this kind of pinnacle shining beacon in the world at the time. And this is a, pretty much the origin of how the corruption seeps into Gotham City, how it becomes the Gotham we eventually know, and it's all centered around the Wayne family. At the end of the first issue, we actually find out that the kind of first person sort of narrative style, that kind of terse, hard-boiled style, it's all basically Slam recounting these events to a present day Batman. And he addresses him as Bruce. He knows who Batman is. And the feeling we get is that Slam is really trying to communicate this whole story to him because he feels like he should know and he feels like he should know the legacy of his family and Gotham City. It's a really just really fascinating frame narrative. It's a really great story and it's so very immersive. I think one of the things that Tom King does in this work that surprised me and really impressed me in some ways is that there's a lot of like racial prejudice, civil rights kind of undertones and even themes throughout this book. We have a lot of the kind of different racial classes within Gotham City explored in a real way. We get to see how Wayne's sort of set themselves up uh, to be kind of pariahs in certain communities within Gotham City, especially along racial or class lines. We have kind of North Gotham and South Gotham and one is more of a kind of ghetto uh, region of the city, and the other one is kind of the ritzy, aristocratic, erudite, kind of smug class. 
uh, and we have that tension kind of all bubbling under the surface. And while everything is still really pristine, you get this feeling that everything is just so close to riot. Like everything is just right under the surface. And this event of the missing girl just kind of kicks everything up a notch and we just have everything spilling over. Uh, throughout this book, we have a lot of just backstory on the character of Slant Bradley. We have kind of his arcs and where he comes from. We get to see his some of his parentage and sort of what drives him. Uh, but he really feels in many ways like a stock, um, just private eye, kind of that, again, that kind of noir uh, protagonist that you just really know and love. And we have the Waynes, who are, again, kind of this royal family, but we get to see them in a really unflattering light. These are really deeply flawed characters, and we get to see just this whole arc of them trying to find this little girl. I think I am getting a bit ahead of myself here. Just going back to kind of a basic synopsis of this book, we open with this detective agency. We again have that first-person narration that so fits this genre. We have our main character, Slam Bradley, who has his own kind of PI firm, and in walks this character who we come to know as Queenie, who basically has a letter to be delivered to Mr. Wayne, uh, Bruce Wayne's grandfather, with $100, basically saying, you can have the $100. All I need you to do is deliver this envelope. They should be expecting it. Well, he goes ahead and does this job. He has uh, Queenie followed by his sort of second-in-command at the PI agency while he goes to the Waynes to drop off this envelope. When this happens, though, we find out that the envelope contains sort of the ransom information for this lost girl uh, that no one knows in the media that has been kidnapped so far. They've kind of kept it under wraps, and immediately the Waynes turn on Slam Bradley, thinking he's affiliated somehow. Their hired goons basically rough him up, and he's left wondering what the heck's going on, and he wants to find this lost girl. Meanwhile, his second-in-command is found basically murdered after following this elusive woman who gave them the letter and that really kicks off this whole kind of conspiracy detective crime piece we have with Gotham City Year One. Uh, throughout the issues, we again get some backstory on that main character. We get where he comes from. There's again a lot of racial tension explored within Gotham City. We see what the Waynes are up to. They're basically about to have a turning point and open this sort of chemical factory in a place in town that's really not welcoming for the Waynes. And we have them kind of, again, just captains of industry, kind of like Rockefellers, royals, just trying to kind of make their way. Uh, we have them wanting to save their little girl. We get this feeling like the marriage between Mr. and Mrs. Wayne is really toxic and not great. I think it's interesting to see how flawed these characters are, and yet there's still just influences and little shadows of these characters I see in Bruce Wayne in different ways that I thought was fascinating. And we have the more that Slam Bradley starts to uncover this mystery, the worse things kind of get for all these characters involved. And ultimately, it basically culminates with them finding out that the husband has been unfaithful to his wife. He's done all sorts of nasty, perverse things, and he's basically out of money. He squandered a lot of the wealth, and all they have left now is what Mrs. Wayne brought into the marriage. And to try to get some of that money for himself and to kind of keep from bankruptcy, he's basically kidnapped his own daughter and is basically ransoming her to get some of his wife's money. It's a really insidious plot that goes horribly awry when the daughter is meant to be taken somewhere safe but chokes on her own vomit and passes away and is then buried in someone's yard and it frames someone else and we find that the mom found out about this and found the daughter dead and basically tried to play this up the best she could for her own interests and it's just a really nasty horrible crime story here that makes the Waynes look absolutely terrible and it leads to a lot of really intense compromises we have the character of Queenie actually being kind of a noble character with some uh, hint of Catwoman in her that I find fascinating. We have kind of an illicit affair between Slam Bradley and Mrs. Wayne that's kind of fascinating. And ultimately, we're left with just not really sure what to do with the resolution. Everything is so nasty. We have the, uh, well, without spoiling too much, we have a couple of the primary characters that do not make it out alive of the story. But we have, again, that's kind of cynical narration from Slam Bradley. We go back and forth between uh, this storytelling in the past and a couple frame moments in the present where Slam, like kind of on his deathbed, is telling all this to Batman, who he knows as Bruce Wayne. And it's just a really haunting story. I think it really plays with just this idea of class, this idea of race. I do think it's interesting to see, like, kind of what Tom King is suggesting here that 
Gotham used to be something great, but then there was something just bubbling under the surface, and ultimately the Wayne family was directly involved with just causing the corruption and kind of curse that lingers over Gotham after all of this happened. Uh, we also have this chemical factory that they're trying to open the whole time. We find out that it's this Wayne chemical factory that does well for a while, then does poorly, and then Mrs. Wayne ends up selling it later on and to a company called Ace. And we find out that that... The, the sight of all this corruption and the kind of focal point of one of the set pieces of this book, rather, this chemical factory, ultimately becomes the ace uh, chemical factory where the Joker is supposedly born. I just think it's so interesting how the Wayne legacy just tarnishes Gotham and kind of the idea that it, you know, eventually brings about the Joker and brings about Batman. And it's just really fascinating. We have this moment where the ransom letters are uh, signed with a bat symbol. So the whole time Slam Bradley's looking for someone called the Bat. Batman, thinking that's the name to call the kidnapper. We find out that that's really having to do with this sort of cave on the premises of the Wayne Manor, where Mr. Wayne was having kind of these illicit dalliances. Anyway, it's just all really fascinating. I think that for really big Batman fans out there, there is very little actual Batman in this. I think that this is so much more for fans of crime noir, a good detective fiction. This is really something I could have seen written by Ed Brubaker and illustrated by Sean Phillips. It feels like that kind of genre in a really powerful and good way. I'm actually really excited to see Tom King flex his kind of crime noir muscles in this way. I would definitely like to read more from Tom King in this genre in the future. I think that this could have, with just a few alterations, been like an indie published title with no affiliation to Batman. I think the fact that this is Gotham City, we do have a little bit of Batman, we do have some of that history and lore in there, like I said, the Ace Chemical Factory, things like that. It just elevates this even more for me, because it feels like a detective crime thriller that has that thin veneer or coating of Batman, and I just really love that cross-section. I think it works exceptionally well, and I think that this is just a really fascinating read. I don't know if it's for everyone, but I certainly enjoyed the ride. As far as the art goes throughout this from Phil Hester, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's very consistent throughout. It's very uh, angular, rough, sometimes hideous or grotesque. I think that the panel formatting is all pretty rectangular, boxy, uh, straight-laced. I think everything about it just screams noir. Like I said, there's something in this that just feels really true and authentic. I think it plays to genre perfectly, and that can be seen absolutely in the art style throughout it. I really like the real just formulaic rectangular panel layouts because every time we have a splash image or things that break that form it really is just a striking contrast and I absolutely love it um, I think again the writing from Tom King is really sharp here it really plays to the genre as well but I do think we still get to see some of the beauty of Tom King's mostly lyric writing kind of thrown through a kind of noir filter in a way that just works I love seeing King channeled through this kind of detective first person narrative narration rather just really great. Um, as far as the back of this book goes, we have a variant cover art gallery. We have some behind the scenes kind of scripting and just sketches kind of pages at the back. I think it's a really fun handful of extras at the back of the standard size trade paperback. This is definitely a book that's going to stay with me for a while. I really enjoyed it. There's obviously more spoilers here. I'm not getting to and so much just rich narrative here that can be mined into, but I cannot speak highly enough about this book. I did thoroughly enjoy it. I really hope this finds the audience it's intended for. If it didn't in single issues, I'm hoping people get word of mouth on this collection because I do think it's something really special. And I think in a market that's so flooded with Batman content, Gotham City Year One really has something unique to offer. And I really hope more people seek it out. And lastly, before we get to the grade at the end of this video, I do want to just share one of my favorite moments or quotes at the very end of this book, the last page. We have Batman, after hearing Slam Bradley's story, saying, what does this mean? And he just responds with, doesn't mean anything, just what happened a long time ago. I just like the futility of this, the whole, like, what was the point of all this? But there was so much rich legacy and implications in this work. And I think that the way they ended this, it just felt very just detective crime, just epic. I really just loved it. I think it was really rounded out nicely. Such a great collection. Anyway, happy to review it today. Now let's go give it a grade. For this pitch-perfect detective crime noir set against a 1960s Gotham with stunning artwork on each and every page, the Comic Book Report is happy to give Gotham City Year One by Tom King and Phil Hester an A-. 
Yes, this is a book I highly recommend. It's one of my favorite books I've read at the back half of this year. Really enjoyed my time here. I am admittedly a Tom King fan. I also am a crime detective thriller fan, and this was just right up my alley. I think it's fun for Batman fans, but it's definitely fun for crime comic fans, or if you like kind of the detective, uh, gritty sort of feel in comic book fiction, uh, fans of Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips' work, I think that this can be for you, especially if you have a passing interest in Batman. I had a blast with this book. You'll have to let me know what you think in the comments below. Have you read Gotham City Year One? Let me know. Are you planning to pick it up? I'd love to hear about all of that. And until next time, this has been the Comic Book Report. Please don't forget to give this video a like, a comment, and maybe share it with a friend. Until next time, have a good one.